Uh, Matt Paterini here with the uh, Non-Traditional Pharmacist. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jim O'Donnell. And he's actually the founding editor of the Journal of Pharmacy Practice. And, and they uh, published a list uh, in an article highlighting about 600 job titles occupied by uh, pharmacists. And I'll let him expand on that, but I thought that was pretty interesting given, given our role here at the Non-Traditional Pharmacist and highlighting a lot of those different roles. Uh, so today we'll learn about those different roles maybe learn about some pharmacy entrepreneurship as uh, Dr. O'Donnell owns a consulting pharmacy or a consulting company, uh, Pharma Consultant Incorporated. Uh, so, hey, thanks a lot for joining today, Jim. Oh, you're welcome. It's good to, good to speak with you. So for our first question, uh, if you'd like to give us a brief overview of your career, uh, we'd certainly be interested in hearing about that given uh, your, the non-traditional nature of the, your career path. Well, I started out traditionally. I uh, have a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois College of Pharmacy. And uh, when I discovered that there were other things to do other than work in drugstores, I selected or decided to do graduate work. And I learned about the University of Michigan. I was fortunate to learn about it. And I went there for PharmD after I did a residency. Uh, I did the Farm B 30 years before it was a requirement, and it certainly was a, uh, and a very important key to my career development. Uh, my first uh, position after Michigan was as a uh, manager slash clinical pharmacist at the Cook County Hospital in Chicago. And I selected a, uh, a practice site that needed the most contribution. It was challenging. It was really frontier work. And I was able to develop uh, practice models before practice models were developed. Uh, with that um, experience uh, behind me, I was hired uh, in a management position at a very large hospital across, literally across the street, the Rush University Medical Center, uh, where I had a very rewarding uh, management and clinical career, again, developing practice models. Uh, I was, uh, I spent the last several years of my active practice at Rush as a clinical specialist in, in TPN management. And as part of my uh, practice at County and at Rush, I was teaching doctors how to write TPN prescriptions and feed people. Uh, I had an opportunity to um, get a master's degree in nutrition, which I did. Uh, and I always encourage people to always gain additional credentials if, if they are, the opportunity presents themselves. Uh, and in 1988, after almost 20 years of clinical practice, I, um, my employment ended and I launched into a consulting career, um, which at one time had a, a, a different company name, but for all intents and purposes, it is uh, Pharma Consultant Incorporated. And we'll talk about what I do in that consulting activity. Yeah, great. Hey, uh, that's interesting. And by the way, love the tie, go blue. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so you, you highlighted a lot of different roles and, and additional credentials and things like that. What's your vision of the pharmacy profession on a whole from your perspective, given the different experiences that you've had? Well, I learned early that um, the provision of the product was an assumption, but pharmacy really, pharmacists really have to think of themselves as providing a value added service. And uh, I, I've always liked uh, and tried to position myself as providing a value added service, one that's not tied to distribution and, and indeed one that the, the service itself is not, does not become a commodity. And that way uh, the fees that I'm able to charge are determined by how valuable this is to the client, not uh, somebody looking up on a list and saying, well, a consultant pharmacist earns $30 an hour, and I'm obviously dating myself here. Uh, 
Uh, secondly, um, distributive services will be automated. Um, filling prescriptions and handing out prescriptions is going the way of blacksmiths and even cork in wine bottles. Uh, better, better wine now comes with screw tops, not just the ripple of my day when I was at Michigan. Um, I have a couple, uh, you know, negative messages here. Stop training technicians to do cognitive tests. You're giving away your bread and butter. Uh, pharmacists should be doing medication histories and reconciliations and taking prescriptions from doctor's offices, not technicians. Uh, and the oversupply is real. I've seen it. Uh, it ha it's having a negative effect on salaries. It's even having a negative effect, effect on the applicant pool for colleges of pharmacy. Of course, now we have 50 more colleges of pharmacy than were ex in existence when I was in, uh, was in college. Um, so, but the, pos the very positive message is we're in a, a unique position. Um, we are, we should be the drug e experts uh, and no one questions that what indeed we are, but we have to prove it and proving it makes us valuable. And that is what justifies that value added service. Yeah, I, I really like what you said. Two things that you mentioned there was the oversupply is real. And that again, taps into really what we're trying to do with our project here is highlighting all of the different things that pharmacists are able to do in all of these different roles. Um, and also the value add service that you were talking about. And that kind of segues into um, what you do at Pharma Consultant Incorporated, because I really want to hear about that. Um, but it sounds like it's, it's kind of a dynamic system where the services that you provide and the fees that go along with those services can change based on the value that it either brings to the business or the patients that are using them. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. Could you expand on exactly what those services are and, and some of the detail around what you do at Pharma Consultant? Well, let me give you a, a little bit of history. Even before I launched into a full-time consulting career, I was consulting. Uh, and even to, in the last few years, I was consulting 50% and, and had my hospital practice 50%. But I always looked outside the four walls of the hospital because drug use is ubiquitous. It affects every life and every business. Uh, some obviously more than others. And I looked for opportunity. I, at first I had opportunities where people from the outside were asking for help. Can we talk to you about how this product can be improved? How do you use this product? So that's marketing and sales consulting, uh, sales training, um, uh, technical. Uh, I, I, in fact, my first long-term uh, industrial contract was as a result of a small company constantly asking me questions. And I said, why don't we formalize this? We'll meet once a month and you uh, will develop, we developed a newsletter for the company. We developed speaking programs. We did, uh, we did product development, product assessment, uh, sales training, uh, sponsored lectures. And these are all outside value added services uh, that the company needed. So what I did as a, as a consultant while employed was targeted. I, I recognized and looked for other companies that might need the same type of services. Uh, another example is local government, boards of health, public health, mental health, um, regulatory agencies, anybody having to do with regulation of healthcare, Drugs are ubiquitous in that area. Um, I was, in fact, that's how I got my start in uh, legal consulting as I was asked, I was recognized as being a, a, an expert pharmacist in, in the hospital I practiced in. And I was recommended to the board of pharmacy as an expert uh, to comment on the, uh, whether or not the pharmacist was deviating from the standard of care in their dispensing of narcotic prescriptions. Sound familiar? 
Well, this was for, literally 40 years ago, the first time I testified. And, um, and so I, each time I learned of a entity or a business uh, area outside my practice, I considered them as potential for uh, marketing services to them. Publishing and education are, are other areas that we have, we clearly have expertise in. Uh, you introduced me as the editor of the Journal of Pharmacy Practice. I've been asked what were, what was, what was my experience that uh, qualified me to be the editor. And really it was that they asked me to do it uh, and being in the right place at the right time. Uh, but also I had published at that time, I had published 30 or 40 articles. Uh, it was very, uh, I, whenever I did anything that was unique or solved the problem in the hospital, I tried to write about it and publish it and share the knowledge uh, to, to other practitioners. I also uh, set my scope outside of pharmacy. Um, I feel like when I'm lecturing to pharmacists, I'm preaching to the choir because they all have the same background. But if I was lecturing to physicians or lawyers or nurses or physical therapists, they have the need for that expertise. And uh, they may, some of them may have an, an interactive experience from the hospital, such as nurses and physicians, but other practitioners don't. And every time you stand in front of a group of anybody, there's a potential that you will get business, future consulting business, uh, and maybe future pro bono consulting business, but that helps too. And that's another thing is don't be afraid to do things uh, for free. It's not free to you because you're spending time to do it. Consider it networking, consider it marketing. Um, I, and, and the same thing with education. I uh, fortuitously, someone, oh, and I know what it was, I, I called a local community college. I said, I'm a, a pharmacist at a, a local university hospital. I'm uh, interested in teaching. Do you have any uh, nursing pharmacology programs you need? Lectures. And I ended up being a course director for 10 years. It gave me experience, gave me credentials. Uh, and it was at, at the time, most pharmacists, uh, would be moonlighting. They'd be, and those jobs were very plentiful at the time. They don't exist at least around here anymore. Um, so publishing was very important, uh, education, contract teaching. Uh, in fact, my partner who happens to be my son, I was, did some contract teaching at a local university and they ended up offering a full-time professorship. So you can't, if you don't get put yourself out there, you're not gonna be found. So the key in any type of consulting or entrepreneur activity is to let people know who you are, what you do, and that you're available because they're not gonna come looking for you. You have to let them know that you're, that you're available. Yeah, that's, yeah. <clears throat> that plays right into our next kind of selfish question of uh, any advice for pharmacy entrepreneurs. I mean, you mentioned putting yourself out there frequently, um, but anything else, you know, that you'd offer for, for people looking to do, you know, something similar to yours or maybe not even consulting, you know, it might be a project like ours in terms of education or whatever it might be. Any advice for pharmacy entrepreneurs? Well, I think, I think there's some basics and I always say, um, Get a good solid practice base. Five to t five to ten years of good solid experience. Be very good at what you do. Uh, network, join, so be, support your alumni, support your your college. Uh, get whatever certifications are available for you. Um, I talked about lecturing and teaching. Um, clearly, these days have a, a, a professionally designed website because that's how people find you now. Um, clear a, any type of outside, uh, and I think consulting is best done as an add-on to what somebody's doing until it gets so large. And my, my, my fortunate for, for me, it became large enough that I could 
it, it made more sense to be a consultant and then do part-time teaching. Um, but, but what make sure you have, you're clear with your employer that there's no conflict of interest because conflicts of interest are uh, if they don't like it, then it's a conflict of interest. Uh, and um, but I think that that's uh, reasonable. I think uh, to to uh, mention um, specifically, uh, reach out to people uh, that you think could be your clients. I mean, I send out letters to uh, potential clients. I've sent out letters to hospitals. I've sent out letters to risk managers, insurance companies, um, pharmacy companies, uh, offering my services as a consultant. Let me give a, an example or two uh, of the type of work that I do. Uh, and because it, 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 I, I don't try to trace the, the response rate because it doesn't mean anything to me, but it's, it's very common for people to pick up the phone and call me and say, you know, I just got your letter and I have this project I need help on. Uh, and I, um, in fact, I sent a letter out to a hospital many years ago offering consulting services to hospitals and they called me up and they wanted to interview me for, to be the director of pharmacy. So consulting puts you out there, it puts you in front of a potential client and in be, indeed, every time you're out there and, and interacting with a client, you're you're in an interview for the next client and the next uh, the next activity. Um, this indeed, that's how I got, and I would say the largest part of my practice. Although I've I've pu published six books, and, and you know they're anywhere from 400 to 1,000 page comprehensive textbooks. Uh, titled Drug Injury, uh, Drug Discovery, uh, but I always make sure to maintain a professional presence as a professor, I was a course director, to maintain a strong professional presence, publish, uh, and, and then when you go out as a consultant, you carry the credentials of what you're doing professionally. I don't think it's a good idea for anybody to go out and just unless your job is a consulting pharmacist going to, to nursing homes to do medication reviews. But so many people consult, confuse what I do with, with what the traditional consultant pharmacist does. But I've done the same in, in the legal arena from the, the first time I was asked to serve as an expert before a board of pharmacy, I, um, started to advertise, I started to market and reach out. And, and the more I did this, the more calls I got and I continued marketing. And so right now, a, a bulk of my practice is consulting in uh, personal injury or criminal matters involving drugs. On the personal injury side, uh, alcohol is the largest, the most abused drug. And it's one that we study as pharmacists in pharmacology, and we learn about interactions. Uh, I apply the pharmacokinetics that we've learned to the length of time it takes for uh, alcohol to be eliminated from the body. That's applied in DUI cases, uh, in personal injury cases where people fall downstairs or trip or fall off bar stools or walk in front of cars and, and sue the the people that hit them or own the place. I uh, evaluate the level, uh, I do a kind of a reverse therapeutic drug monitoring and evaluate the level of intoxication, uh, do dose calculations as to how much someone has consumed. Um, and that's the same, and that the alcohol bridges both civil personal injury and the criminal DUI matters um, in, in uh, medical malpractice, healthcare malpractice, there's nursing home, nursing malpractice, medication errors, I have chapters on medication errors, uh, physician, dental, podiatrist, um, 
even psychologists malpractice and optometrists malpractice. Now that they're prescribing and using drugs, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, they're, they're making poor choices or they're sued for a drug injury. And in fact, I, I work on both sides of the, um, in a civil matter, but and, and importantly for the audience, uh, I comment on the standard of care of a pharmacist. What would a, what would a reasonable and prudent pharmacist do in a like or similar situation? I served on the standards of practice committee for the American Pharmacists Association because I wrote an article on standards of practice for the profession of pharmacy. So each time you write something and give a lecture, there's a potential um, payback or return on investment. Um, and and so I, I put myself out there to evaluate a situation and say, uh, the, the company was didn't do what they should have. The company didn't staff adequately. The pharmacist was negligent. The technician expanded. They let the technician expand on their... Uh, legal duties. There's no consulting. This is what happens when there's no consulting patients or counseling patients, excuse me, and cite uh, Mike Cohen's books on when you do patient consulting, cons counseling, you're going to detect 95% of the errors. And so consequently, I have uh, testified and uh, consulted in every state in the union, testified in 35 states and worked in Canada, Ireland, England, South Africa, Bermuda, Virgin Islands. Um, and I continue to do that. Wow. Hey, well, Jim, if uh, the non-traditional pharmacist had any money, we'd hire you as a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> you but, just uh, did. But, uh, but, uh, but given all the uh, different services and, and the level of success that you've had, I mean, are you hiring anyone or are, do you have opportunities to offer anyone that are looking for these types of op uh, opportunities? Well, you know, actually, I um, subcontract out many projects to other pharmacists to do research for me, uh, to, um, to, to do kinetic uh, workups, uh, to... Or, or frankly, I just refer to them because I don't consider myself to be the best qualified for a project. Um, and I think that's something that any consultant should recognize because you're in a better position than, than your client to realize if you're the right person. And that's the best thing you can do for your client. They'll like it because they'll come back to you because they'll say, this person is, is honest. Uh, so I have... Uh, on a regular basis, I have well, right now four or five people that are doing project work for me. Um, and I think it's also important that I give the message that um, well, there's a, there should be an expectation that when you put yourself out as a consultant, that you're able to, your, your services are value-added services, and you're able to charge more for your services than you would if you were occupying a position in a drugstore for eight hours. So I set a goal of having at least a minimum of three or four times the hourly, the, the hourly norm for a pharmacist, and sometimes up to 10 times that rate. And uh, depending on the market, depending on the venue, depending on the type of service offered because they are value added services the client believes that you're going to be able to help them provide value for them uh the fees are paid yeah yeah that's great what what uh specific services you mentioned the kinetic um evaluations anything else uh that you're looking for well, people that might be able to provide those and and what would pe what could people do if they're interested in contacting you about that, what could they do? Well, they just send me an email, go to my website, which is uh, www.jamestodonnell.com. Send me an email, send me their CV. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this uh, as I'm doing now. Um, uh, I, you know, I have uh, a, developmental toxicologist that's working on a project for me, a uh, neuroscientist who specialized in uh, 
um, obsessive uh, disorders who worked on a, a brain neurotoxicity, a drug from a drug administration, intrathecal drug administration. I routinely use the services of, uh, of an ER pharmacist for uh, critical care uh, evaluations because I'm, because I'm not in that setting uh, on a daily basis now. Uh, so they can contact me. Uh, but more importantly, uh, what I think the message that I'd like to share is that we have expertise, and but no one's people are not going to come and find you. You have to let them know that you're available. And if you understand what a client is doing, uh, then and let them know, then there's that you have a better opportunity to be hired for a project. And, and, and just to follow up on one uh, comment you made earlier in the interview, the 670 job titles uh, was published in the Journal of Pharmacy Practice. And I think the title of that particular issue was alternate practice. Okay. Uh, and Don Rucker, who was a, the prof a professor of pharmac pharmacy administration at the University of Illinois compiled that list uh, and and pharmacists have non-traditional positions. I've limited myself to be a consultant because I'd rather stay on my own. But pharmacists have positions, and as as all of you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, but in other industries as well, and in government, very widely and extensively. I mean, I've worked in venture capital. Uh, I've worked, of course, I've worked in education, um, law enforcement. Um, I've even worked for a turkey farmer who was trying to figure out how uh, or if dipping the eggs in a genomycin uh, egg dip uh, was, was embryo toxic or not. Uh, so it's been interesting. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. And, you know, thanks again for all your thoughts and uh, you know, all your insight. Uh, any closing thoughts before we uh, wrap up? Uh, yes. Um, uh, pharmacists are important. Be proud to be a pharmacist and uh, put yourself out there. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks for your time. And uh, you know, hopefully everyone found this very helpful, very interesting. If you do uh, wanna talk to Jim more, uh, we encourage you to leave a comment on this particular post, but also leave us a message in our connect section on www.thenontraditionalpharmacist.com. We'll also include uh, Jim's website on here that he mentioned, and uh, so we can, we can put you in contact if you want to uh, talk to Jim further about those services that he mentioned. Uh, really excited to, to listen to everyone on your feedback. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, and as always, keep thinking outside the pillbox. Take care. <laughs>